tell me who that person is. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to introduce you. I, not now. I, that, why does she have to stay here? Oh, but I don't want her here. Why does she have to stay? Okay, I mean, so you really should tell me that. I really don't want her to be here. I don't think I should. I mean, you know, why do I care who my baby is? What does that have to do with me? It no, makes me no. feel very uncomfortable. No, can't. Okay, lovely. Ready? Smile, please. Okay, great. And five, four, three. Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and welcome to American Architecture Now. Today we'll be talking to Michael Pitas. Do you like to be called Pitas? Did I pronounce that? How would Pitas. you say that? Pitas? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Can you straighten your pearls out? I on the outside of the microphone. No, oh, here, let me help you. Oh, there's a 20th. There. There's a 20th century. Mm -hmm. Like pita's bread. That's exactly I'm sorry. right. I'm sorry. I'll tell you the story about that later. I'd like to hear well, that. And I have to tell you about a Greek friend of mine and who Five, four, has just done a three, series about five. Greek art. Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and welcome to American Architecture Now. Today we'll be talking to Michael Pitas. Hi, Barbara Lee. Hi, Michael <laughs> Pitas. Tell me about the bread. Is that really the plural? Okay, you ready? Yeah. Go on then. That's true. Is it the plural? Yeah. yeah. Actually, it means baker. Mm -hmm. You think it's what? Baker? Yeah. Yes. I want to do the first paragraph and just read. Is it on Q paragraph? Yes. Okay. Excuse me a sec. Okay. Maybe you can have and count at least. Five, four, three. Architect, city planner, teacher, and director since 1978 of the National Endowment for the Arts Design Arts Program, Michael Pitas has long been committed to improving the quality of our built environment. It's a very real pleasure to welcome you here, Michael. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Okay. Want to put them all together? Safety? Yes. The, uh, the, intro. the hello and then the... Right, we're not, not going to start the intro <coughs> at this point. Okay, stand by, please. Steve, do you have those in order? Okay, just a little bit quicker. Okay. I don't need that, thank you. Okay, never mind, never mind. Okay, counting down, please. Five, four, three... Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and welcome to American Architecture Now. Today we'll be talking to Michael Pitas. He looks very serious. Now continue on. Are you ready? Architect, city planner, teacher, and director since 1978 of the National Endowment for the Arts Design Arts Program. Michael Pitas has long been committed to improving the quality of our built environment. It's a pleasure to welcome you here, Michael. Thank you, Barbara Lee. It's my pleasure to be here. Okay. What are we doing now? We'll go right into the interview. We're not going to do up front again? Would you like to do it again? Whatever. Uh, Richie said that it was fine. It was fine, Barbara Lee. ready to do the intro. Let's go and do the camera and then I can look at you. It's great pleasure. <laughs> okay, we have to see the end now. This is the outro. Thank you. Okay, and counting. Five, four, three. For your sensitivity and your insight into these challenging issues, Michael Pitas, our thanks to you. Thank you. For your sensitivity and your insight into these challenging issues. Our thanks to you, Michael Pitas. Thank you. For, Shall I be looking at Michael or the camera? Look at him, don't, don't make the move forward like you did. 
for your eloquence and your insight into these important and challenging issues. Our very special thanks to you, Michael Pitas. Thank you, Barbara Lee. <clears throat> for your eloquence and for your insight into these important and challenging issues, thanks to you, Michael Pitas, for being with us today. Thank you. Should I give you a little hint about what we're going to talk about? Mm -hmm. Come closer a sec. I'll give mm -hmm. you a little hint about what we're going to talk about. Everything we talked about when we were alone. We're going to start with your childhood. If you make anything that, a mistake that you think is a mistake, mm -hmm. there is no such thing. Yes, just give, okay, just give us a pause that we can get in and cut around it. Okay. And if you, just, you don't like what you're saying, just stop. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you don't say I don't like it, just start all over. <laughs> okay. All right. And count Five, four, four, three. I will. Thank you. Did I change it for the... Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, goody. Mm -hmm. In talking about your growing up years, Michael, you've described yourself as a candy store kid. What does that mean? And how did your... Okay. In talking about your growing up years, You've described yourself as a candy store kid, Michael. What does that mean? Well, I suppose from the uh, point of view of the Lower East Side in New York City, a working class kid being brought up in an ethnic neighborhood, candy store kid referred to those uh, uh, adolescents uh, who had nothing better to do but to hang out and uh, put nickels in jukeboxes at that point in my life. Well, how did those early experiences influence your choice of a career? Hmm. I think more than anything else, um, being brought up in New York City, uh, in this kind of environment, an extraordinary environment, uh, which can make one as provincial and as myopic as an um, Iowa farmer, um, it uh, very much influenced my desire to want to make some changes uh, or to be influential in some way or another. In, in, in so you're saying that being better. born in New York was, and bred in New York was really useful to your work? Oh, no doubt about it. Was it ever a hindrance to your work? Yes, uh, clearly a hindrance at uh, one point in my career when um, uh, that limited view that New York City sometimes puts on people who doesn't allow them to uh, expand. And um, uh, I found myself uh, designing in, in a manner and in a mode uh, which was quite acceptable for urban, very tight urban frameworks, but uh, not very acceptable for the kinds of uh, uh, broad expanses that cities like Houston, Dallas, and uh, the Middle East presented, uh, and which were the commissions I was dealing with at that time. How did you first become interested in the design arts? Hmm. I suspect um, it occurred uh, as a student at Music and Art High School where uh, I felt uh, I was going to uh, become uh, the next Picasso. And, uh, Were you an art major? Uh, yes. And, um, That's a long way from a jukebox. How'd you make that transition? <laughs> through some wonderful guidance of, uh, of an art teacher in, uh, in uh, elementary school who uh, I suspect recognized some talent that uh, I wouldn't have known was there, nor would uh, uh, my parents have known at that time. Uh, so it was a natural transition from uh, uh, learning that um, one didn't make an, a living in painting uh, to recognizing and acknowledging that one would have to do so at some point or another. I think architecture became the nat natural outlet for that uh, need to express. Your your educational background. Your educational background includes training in architecture at Cooper Union and then graduate degrees at Princeton University. That really does sound like quite a far cry from the kind of earlier experiences that you describe. In fact, it sounds like a certainly new and unfamiliar experience for you. Was there anything that was especially inspiring or influential in either of those two environments? Well, certainly the uh, technical training of Cooper Union uh, uh, 
is just uh, extraordinary. There's uh, no finer school in my mind uh, in giving a, a youngster uh, some ability to actually perform a task. Uh, there are very few schools like it left in the country. Well, knowing what you do about what goes on in this country, that's quite a statement to make, and especially mm -hmm. for a school that mm -hmm. does not charge tuition. That's quite That's remarkable. right. It is the only free private institution left in the country. Therefore, its uh, uh, student body is there by merit and merit alone. Uh, so one struggled. I entered with a class of 54 and graduated with a class of 8. Uh, and that wasn't simple attrition. That was being asked to leave if, if you didn't live up to the uh, goals of the school. On the other hand, Princeton represented an entirely different kinds of, kind of education. What did that represent? Finishing for you? school. Did it help? Oh, I should say so, yes. What was particularly influential there for you? Mm -hmm. That was the uh, emerging period, the nascent period of uh, both uh, the Anglo influence on architecture and uh, the beginnings of postmodernism as a major influence in this country. Uh, people like Peter Eisenman and uh, Tony Vidler and Ken Frampton uh, and others uh, uh, were there at that time. Uh, Michael Graves was just beginning, so um, uh, that emerging. Uh, uh, um, well, that certainly came. was an unusual group that was at Princeton at that time. I wonder if you can tell us about that group that was often described as being contending and even contentious. What ferment was going on there and what ideas emerged from that experience that influenced you? Well, it certainly led me to having the thought that I had to make some choice in what I was going to do with my life. Uh, it was clear that the postmodernists uh, or the postmodernist influence were uh, involved heavily with the form of building. Uh, I was, uh, by predisposition um, and background, uh, someone who was involved with uh, the behavioral and social content of buildings as well. So uh, I wouldn't want to characterize uh, uh, the virtues of postmodernism in any way, but I would say that it did cause me to go in somewhat of a different direction than than uh, uh, my colleagues were going. Was at your that time. goal at that time to practice architecture or to become an urban planner or something else entirely? Most assuredly, I wanted to uh, practice architecture. I wanted the immortality of buildings and uh, to have my name in history. Well, you have your name in history now, but it may not be how you originally intended oh. it for. You, it may not be how you, but it may not be how you int <laughs> Forget that whole sentence. <laughs> By the way, how did you make the transition from art to architecture? Oh, uh, it's simply a recognition and acknowledgement of economic necessity, uh, as I think so many other people actually do at some point or another. Uh, there's an awful lot of talent uh, that uh, doesn't get recognized out there. But then again, um, you know, if one has the luxury and privilege of being able to uh, uh, become a fine artist, a visual artist, uh, one also takes on a, a great deal of pain and, and suffering in that period of time. I guess I uh, made the choice between a limited degree of pain and suffering uh, in, in an architectural career. Well, there are some who might think that there is uh there is luxury and privilege to pursuing a career in architecture. It isn't the easiest of paths, and it certainly isn't the most economically rewarding, at least not for the first 40 years of anyone's practice. No, no doubt about it. Uh, architects are, by and large, uh, amongst the most influential of professional groups in this country and the most powerless at the same time. Powerless? Uh, oh, certainly. Um, Fortune magazine has this uh, wonderful um, thing that they do every few years. They list the top 100 or so uh, professions in this country, and they do so in two ways. Uh, the first list is uh, uh, by uh, the income that one makes, and the other list is by the status uh, of the professions. And invariably, architects uh, turn out to be about third from the top under astrophysicists in terms of status. In terms of income, they're around third from the bottom. Uh, so How do you explain that great divergence? That disparity? Hmm. Uh, 
that divergence is explained to some extent by uh, the nature of the composition of the, of the architectural professions. Uh, roughly about 4% of the large architectural firms in this country dominate oh, roughly somewhere between 30 and 40% of the major commissions. So there are people making money and exerting power and influence. Why is that the case? Is it because only a handful of firms are really equipped to carry on large-scale jobs and therefore they continue to get more of them, a certain cycle that perpetuates itself? Yeah, there's little doubt about it. Uh, uh, despite uh, uh, this being a country which acknowledges and celebrates uh, competitiveness, uh, we do not or have not done so with respect to the commissioning of architecture. Uh, yes, there's a quite catch-22. If you have not done it before, you are not likely to be given the opportunity to do it again. Uh, to a large extent, uh, that's led uh, me and uh, uh, more recently the National Council for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts to uh, uh, see this as an issue of opportunity uh, in the design professions and uh, to put forward a program of active advocacy for design competitions. Uh, Do competitions make a difference? Do they change the quality of design? Significantly? Yes. No, I would not submit that that's the case at all. What's all the value of competition? Opportunity, then? equity, fairness. Um, I think that's, that's really uh, the major issues involved uh, with our uh, advocacy of competitions. I will Are not assert Are competitions in favor these days? I thought that they had reached a quiescent period, and other than your encouragement of them, are there many around? Uh, yes. <laughs> Why? I think the answer. Uh, well, I think... Uh, How does it come, take place? Who pays for them? How does it all work? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the first thing I th think is to understand the new imperative uh, about why design competitions are becoming uh, more noticeable on the landscape. Uh, and again, it, it has to do with a very pragmatic assessment by the architectural professions uh, that they uh, will not be able to do business as usual and uh, they will not, those large firms will not be able to dominate the fields very much longer. Uh, the end result is that because of certain, believe it or not, antitrust rulings of the Department of Justice in terms of setting fees and being able to uh, discipline uh, members of the American Institute of Architects through their code of ethics, those two adverse decisions um, have led to a situation whereby architects uh, found themselves being exploited in private competition. Uh, in other words, being asked to produce work, design work, schematic, almost full job development drawings in order to procure a commission. So it, it has become in their interest, the interest of the large firms which uh, dominate the, uh, the membership organizations, uh, to uh, promote uh, a situation in which uh, there is competitiveness. And what about equal and what about equal opportunity legislation? How has that influenced the profession? Hardly at all. Uh, roughly 3% of, uh, of licensed architects in this country are women and less than 1% are minorities. Uh, so from the point of view of a profession that uh, um, is broadly representative, uh, you'd have to come to the conclusion that it is not. Is, that is the limitation really because of the economic and social and cultural hierarchies that are a part of architecture? Well, they certainly are influential. Um, architecture is an applied art which has been very closely associated with the uh, establishment groups in almost every society, with the brief exception of, of, of the period in which the Bauhaus uh, the Bauhaus's philosophy, as well as its form, uh, was was held in uh, held sway. Um, the international style's uh, early uh, manifestation has had as much was as much a social doctrine as it was uh, a new physical form. Uh, to, uh, a social influence. doctrine that led us to believe what? Well, that was uh, certainly had roots in, in, in European socialism of the 1930s, uh, who saw as its principal client uh, the working class rather than uh, the uh, client 
uh, clientele of the merchant class or more royal class, uh, depending on, on what kind of society we're talking about. Uh, but architecture uh, was, uh, was and always has been uh, a profession that has responded more to uh, the powerful and moneyed interest, and is more so today. Well, partially, uh, too, who can afford to commission <laughs> architects to work. Well, um, that's, a, that's an interesting problem because uh, in point of fact, architects have a, uh, let's say the product of their work is very pervasive. Uh, inescapable, I might and add. Inescapable, yes. Uh, both good and bad, uh, oftentimes worse than it should be. Uh, but to point to architecture as only the products of um, uh, Philip Johnson and uh, a handful of um, the well-known names uh, is not to admit that pervasive influence and how many architects are there in this country today? Roughly about s somewhere between 70 and 80,000. It's not quite certain exactly how many are out there. Um, a profession that has not grown substantially. Uh, and how many of them practice architecture? Well, I think all of them claim to pl practice architecture. The Bureau of Labor Statistics shows a 2% unemployment rate, which basically means that uh, the, the large number of, that a large number of architects are working at other professions, like driving cabs and other such uh, things. Like every other profession. Yeah. By the way, how do architects get jobs? You talked about a, the sense of competition that we venerate in this country. What about the meritocracy? Is that the way an architect gets a job? No, I wouldn't. Uh, that, I'd say that certainly there is a high degree of, uh, of merit in how choices are made amongst those who've already b become established. Uh, one hires Philip Johnson and not some other architect because one uh, who's known uh, because uh, he, one believes that, that that he's going to do a better job. As to how... Is it also easier to get financing for a project that a well-known, celebrated, and or distinguished architect is responsible for? Uh, I think sometimes there's a positive liability uh, in, in that um, um, more cautious investors uh, in buildings uh, sometimes see uh, na name brand architects as potentially architects who will, who will arrive at cost overruns on buildings and create more expense than, than not. We don't particularly have a reputation for um, uh, handling our fiduciary trusts and uh, buildings very well. That's the artist part of the architect. No doubt about it. You take refuge, all of you, in that. Mm -hmm. Well, Is it more expensive to have an architect? What about ordinary men and women who really just want a house somewhere? But in fact, they have an architect. Uh, the, the myth that architects don't participate in normal subdivision and track built uh, housing in this country is nonsense. Uh, they're just a different type of architect. Well, have, will you differentiate the various kinds of architects for us? Oh, I don't think that's uh, appropriate or fair of me to do. Uh, uh, well, no. when you say different kind, different from what? Um, different from those who, uh, whose practice is widely celebrated and published. Um, these are people who uh, tend to make very good livings um, doing standard um, types of designs which are replicated many, many times, and it's like collecting royalties on books. Uh, and they do. And they, collect, uh, they make a very good living. Well, it. very few authors would make the same claim. <laughs> Perhaps of romance novels, it would be the, the, the an well, maybe analogy it's the of, 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 in that area. <clears throat> there seems to be a great change on the part of the public in general to the acceptance and awareness of architecture. Is it something that I notice because I'd like to notice that, or is that in fact the case? No, I, th I think it, it is definitely the case. Uh, and is there it, a greater awareness on the part of the public of architecture no now? No question about it. And uh, I think there are some rather broad reasons for that, which have little to do with what architects are producing, uh, in my mind. I think it has a great deal to do with a change in the last few decades uh, in an attitude about uh, the cultural traditions in this country. Uh, for example, I would uh, link uh, postmodernism, uh, conservative politics, uh, Broadway revivals, 
uh, historic preservation and natural conservation as part and parcel of one singular kind of Sounds universal like event. Sounds nostalgia that you're talking about. Well, in part it is, and, and that's one of the manifestations of it. But in fact, it, it, it seems to me that we are a culture looking back for roots, seeking and willing to pre preserve tradition and resources, uh, being in fact forced into that position uh, uh, by virtue of OPEC at one point and another, but not, not, not unwillingly so. So that uh, when, when, when you find interest in the artifacts of society, uh, you may be seeing a, a shift in the whole cultural ethos of that society. Is it in part too because we preferred what we think we once had to what we are getting now? I think no doubt of that. Uh, the disaffection with uh, that boring uh, same glass and steel box yes. so that any alternatives even you know the house that you were not very admiring of that your grandmother lived in looks a lot better to most Indeed. folks than what they see themselves surrounded by now. Indeed. Uh, you know, it, it's always struck me as strange that at a period of time, well, say the last 50 years, in which the palette of architects in terms of the technology, materials, uh, and a whole host of other forms that, that emerge from that uh, has been so rich to have seen uh, so little richness produced in the form of enduring architecture, uh, which, which gains that respect over time. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm not sure that whether that's altogether correct. I mean, there's a famous line in uh, in a movie called Chinatown. In What's which, the line? Oh, the line is, uh, um, crooked politicians, prostitutes, and ugly buildings get get more respectable with time. Right. That's and a formulation I'm not familiar <laughs> with. However, why don't we at least start with some aspect of that? <coughs> and in a sense, not politics but government. How much of an influence on buildings getting better with time has occurred in the almost 20 years that the Design Arts Program of the National Endowment for the Arts exists? Do you think that that program has had a real impact? I think in a therapeutic sense, yes. In uh, a realistic sense? In a realistic sense, um, um, an, an agency which represents so little use of public resources for the purposes of advocating for better public architecture can't really have a very, a very extraordinary effect. Uh, and we're talking about principles and practices uh, which deal with uh, in 50 to 100 year increments. That is the changes in public policy necessary to, cha to, to make a significant change in the environment today wouldn't be felt for another 50 years. So that uh, it would be hard for me to assess those changes that have already occurred and been, been there as a result of the, of the design arts program. Uh, one significant change has been the introduction or the uh, assistance in developing legislation whose purpose it is. Uh, Why don't we take a moment and talk about the National Endowment for the Arts in general, but most specifically the Design Arts Program. Why don't you tell us a bit about its origin and development? Well, I was, it's, it's very intriguing that the initial legislation that Congress passed in 1965-66, which created the National Endowment for the Arts, um, created, said that amongst the many art forms that the uh, federal government ought to support and nurture uh, was architecture. Uh, now, architecture... Whose idea was that, do you think? Well, I haven't, I haven't been able to track that down, uh, and, but my suspicion is... It was is, a fresh idea at the time. I, my suspicion is it was a combination of August Heckscher and uh, Patrick Moynihan, who was then Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce, Commerce and the man who authored the federal principles of architecture. In fact, uh, Moynihan is one of those unsung heroes of architecture. He's done probably more uh, in public life to support good architecture than most people would know. Well, uh, why don't we take a moment and I digress on that point. What has he done? Oh, well, in the first instance was to bring the whole issue of federal architecture to the attention of both Presidents Kennedy and later to uh, Presidents Nixon and Ford. Uh, then as a senator, uh, he helped pass and author uh, the Cooperative Use Act, 
uh, which requires the federal government now, when it needs to build a federal office building, to look first at historically significant and architecturally significant buildings and communities, and second of all, before building one of the more anonymous uh, uh, office buildings that, that the federal government is famous for, and second of all, to uh, introduce into that building other uses other than federal offices, such that the old post office in on Pennsylvania Avenue, on the main street of the United States, uh, is going to be opened in June of this year uh, with uh, something in the order of 50 retail establishments in its bottom floors and it will have two federal agencies, three federal agencies in it uh, on the upper floors. Uh, those will fortunately be the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. So architecture in, came has become a major issue in, the, in that sense, and, and Moynihan's uh, support for it has been fairly significant over time. By the way, just what are the design arts? What does the term include, and who decides what a design art is uh, or isn't? Well, I suppose you can, you can say that there are probably eight identifiable disciplines or, or self-described disciplines. And they include uh, urban design, architecture, landscape architecture, industrial and product design, uh, graphic design, um, and uh, fashion design, uh, amongst uh, several others that are probably in there that I've missed. How do they interrelate with one another? Uh, in various ways. Uh, for example, most architects would submit today that uh, they do better landscape architects than landscape architects. Uh, what they mean is that they do better garden design than landscape architects. Landscape architects do better city planning than city planners do today. Uh, the overlaps are, are, are very humorous in many respects. They're humorous, but I also wonder too if they are not in some ways self-defeating. There seems to be such a fracturing of disciplines in terms of making decisions in, in any one project or in any one city the division between the urban planner, the architect, the landscape architect, and so on. Of course, Is that a good or a bad thing? Of course, historically, those divisions didn't exist. The architect was the master planner, the landscape architect, the communicator, the graphic designer, the product designer, and yeah, all aspects. Isn't there a unity it. sometimes to one sensibility, one hand, one eye, instead oh, I, of competing? I have no doubt that you're absolutely correct. Uh, I think, however... Now let me give you the other side. How about the richness of diversity of many minds collaborating? <laughs> well, I think, I think it, uh, uh, doubtless, that even, even in, in those periods in which the architect dominated, uh, 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 building is a complex undertaking. Uh, uh, the end result is that it was always a collaboration. It was the question of who was king of the hill. Who is king of the hill? Is it the architect? Un unquestionably not. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the developer. Well, <laughs> and it, may be, it may, may not even be the developer any longer. It may be the, uh, the banker or the insurance underwriter is, I think, probably more influential today than the entrepreneurial developer, real estate developer in this country. What about the governmental agency? Uh, certainly. Uh, very important and pervasive influence. Uh, one that is much ignored by both the architectural professions and mostly everybody else. Well, that represents how in the end can it be ignored? I often think that more of a building is designed by external factors than the architect his or herself. You're absolutely correct. Uh, certainly zoning, minimum property standards, uh, codes of, of all sorts uh, indirectly and directly influence uh, the form of buildings everywhere. Uh, beyond that, the direct public construction in this country uh, is close to between 30 and 40 billion dollars annually. Uh, that's taking all public uh, construction into account. Uh, that means that there is something in the order of somewhere between 300 and 600 million dollars worth of architectural and engineering commissions being given out each year. And you ask why then are not architects wealthy? Well, it's basically a service industry. You don't accumulate wealth uh, through that kind of uh, mechanism. But the I most important... I don't exactly understand what you're saying. Well, you're not, you're, not, you're not investing in assets. In other words, the architect doesn't have uh, um, uh, any piece of the uh, real estate pie, or very seldom does, with the exception of, uh, of certain hybrids like John Portman, for example. When the architect himself is the developer. That's right. That's right. In fact, they changed the whole um, uh, American Institute of Architects uh, uh, code of ethics to allow 
uh, that to occur. It was either that or drum John Portman out of the uh, American Institute of Architects. Are there more architects and as developers since his model? No doubt about it, yes. Um, uh, in fact, many uh, of my students I've noticed over 10 years uh, have gone on to business school or uh, have taken intense real estate development courses. Is that partially in self-defense or despair? I suspect it's, it's, it's to a large degree in, uh, in self-defense. I worry a great deal about the degree to which uh, the real estate imperative takes over uh, the design imperative and um, have seen certain of my former students who act more like uh, Bill Zeckendorf in his, uh, in his great day rather than... And how do they feel about their former professor? I wouldn't, know. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know how to comment on that. Why don't we talk about your design arts program for mm -hmm. a moment. What is its most important function as you see it? I think uh, to act as a national clearinghouse for ideas in design. You can't uproot a building and tour it like you do a dance uh, company. Uh, so that when, when something good and original occurs, uh, out in the marketplace of ideas out there, there should be some source through which those ideas filter and then comes back out uh, to those who uh, would like to gain some knowledge about it. Uh, unfortunately, the principal way in which we communicate ideas about design is through visual means. And I say unfortunately because very often uh, it is not the artifactual result that we should be replicating someplace else, whether it's a pedestrian mall or a convention center or a new museum, uh, but we should be uh, replicating the process by which that came into being. Uh, architecture is not a field in which uh, transferable knowledge is much admired. Uh, um, it is, in that sense, very idiosyncratic and very much like other art forms. Well, uh, there are the lessons of history and the forms of history as well. Yes, but we uh, seem to uh, do a good deal of transferring those forms without learning the lessons. Uh, and uh, that's obvious. What's the most important contribution that you think the design arts program makes? Well, that clearinghouse function is there. That small posture it takes with respect to ideas. That is, providing very small amounts of money at the very beginning stages of the formulation of a notion about doing something in, in the design arena. I found over time that as I look back, and I'm really looking back at my predecessors, uh, is that there was a constant idea there that if we just put a little bit of money here, you know, something Sprinkle might... Sprinkle all the seed money bloom. around. Right. Well, did anything bloom? Any wonderful and innovative ideas? Yes, some of the more influential things of, uh, of this For example? Period. Oh, for example, most of the research of Bob Venturi and Denise, Denise Scott Brown's uh, learning from Las Vegas was financed out of, uh, out of grants from the program. Um, on one end of it. So there you have a philosophical, theoretical point of view. On another end, a small grant in 1974, the first federal money into the city of Lowell, Massachusetts, to the school board there to hire some designers to help to change the citizens of Lowell's opinion about what they consider the liability, that is the, the, the old mill buildings there, uh, has generated uh, $40 million in federal money and some $100 million in private investment uh, and, and a, one of the lowest unemployment rates uh, in the country. In, and in isn't Lowell's city. Industrial Park the very model now for other communities? Yes, in terms of historic preservation or understanding how to activate and animate and use historically significant buildings, yes. Tell us more of your success stories. Oh, Some of them are, are interesting ones. Um, for example, uh, one which was a small grant uh, to, an, to an industrial designer uh, not too long ago who asked us for funds to redesign the wheelchair. Uh, well, it seemed like a worthy project and he seemed capable of doing it. Uh, and indeed, he did redesign the wheelchair. And it's interesting that Wolf von Eckhart, in his commentary on it, uh, later on pointed out that the billions of dollars that we are now forced to spend in retrofitting architecture to make it accessible to the handicapped, that at least part of it could have been uh, put to other uses had we started with the idea of redesigning the wheelchair rather than redesigning the building to fit the wheelchair. I think. So, Is uh, this new wheelchair a more 
accessible device? Yes, yes, it's, a, it, it's quite a... Is it going to be of, manufactured? Well, there's the problem, of course. How much does it cost? I mean, it'll probably take the Japanese or the Germans uh, to manufacture it because it turns out that uh, the uh, wheelchair manufacturers in this country... Uh, um, too much inventory. Well, yes, too much inventory, and they're tooled up to do a certain kind of, uh, of thing. There, and there are only two companies, I believe, that produce, or major companies that produce wheelchairs, so there's no reason for them to do other than what they are doing, unless they're given some impetus from outside. What's the most surprising result of any project that you funded? The Vietnam Veterans Memorial Competition. Uh, we neither expected nor anticipated uh, the kind of national catharsis, if I may use that term, that that project created. Will you describe the project and the way you see the public's reaction and the, just describe, you know, the entire process for us. Oh. Let's see. A joint uh, a group of Vietnam veterans went to Congress and asked for a joint resolution of Congress to allow the installation of a memorial on the mall uh, without public funds uh, in the construction of it. Uh, and the, that the memorial was to be dedicated to the memory of the 57,300-odd uh, war dead of uh, Vietnam, not a memorial to the war. And this was a very important distinction. So that when uh, the representatives of, of the vets group came to the endowment and said, how do we go about uh, hiring or commissioning this memorial we want to do, and we suggested at that time a design competition for it, uh, the rules of the competition were very, already had been set by both the joint resolution of Congress and the idea of what it was supposed to accomplish. Now, that was the largest single competition or largest response to a competition that had ever been run in the United States in the past 100 years, 1,450 submissions to it, totally open. You didn't have to be an architect. You could be anybody to it. And there were some rather amusing submissions as well. Uh, we had to get Andrews Air Force Base to give us a hangar to hang them all up. Uh, so that the judging could take place over a five-day period. The first day, uh, someone opened the, uh, uh, the bay doors and a propeller-driven plane drove by and all the racks of drawings went down like toy soldiers. So that was amongst the mechanical problems in the thing. But most importantly, it was a blind competition. And it what does that mean? meant that, uh, that uh, uh, you didn't know who uh, had submitted. It was, uh, there were um, anonymous envelopes in the back of, of each drawing. There. And um, uh, when the winner, Maya Lin, was um, uh, uh, selected. A young woman at that. Yes. And very of oriental young. descent and, uh, and a second year architecture student at Yale, uh, which proves my point about opportunity, not necessarily about design excellence, although I would submit that, that, uh, that the design is uh, a high quality piece of work. Um, well, I think we all know what the. Uh, uh, Why don't you remind us? Well, uh, as you may recall, uh, uh, Secretary Watt and uh, several other individuals, both private and public, objected strenuously to the fact uh, that the uh, memorial did not have representational sculpture um, in it. And a compromise was recently uh, uh, made in which uh, uh, a group of three soldiers uh, uh, in more heroic prose, poses will be placed at some point nearby uh, the monument as it is now uh, uh, done there. The interesting part of it is um, um, Paris Match, Paris Match, um, uh, published recently uh, that solution, the three soldiers, uh, the model, the maquette of it, uh, next to a similar installation that was going, was being put in Hanoi. Uh, and uh, it was quite amazing because the three figures were in almost the same pose, uh, except they were wearing black pajamas rather than uh, American military. Maybe uniforms. that tells us that people really do need more graphic images, more represented, more representational forms to depict. Nonsense. Uh, Nonsense. It's like saying that the Washington Monument ought to have a representational figure of George Washington on top of it. Uh, Did you tell that to any of... Uh, I'm sure somebody must have said something like that at some point or another. Um, the, the memorial as it exists right now is not abstract. It's highly personal. You go there every day and see uh, that people have taken flowers 
and either with tape or push them into the joints next to the names of people kind of thing. You see people reach out and touch, uh, you know, each of the 57,000 names is inscribed on black shiny marble there and reach out and touch the name of somebody who meant something to them. I mean, uh, it's quite an experience and uh, quite beautiful. What was the most controversial thing you've ever funded? Hmm. <laughs> well, the endowment certainly has won its share of uh, Golden Fleece Awards from uh, <laughs> Senator Proxmire. I think some of the programs wear them uh, as badges of approval from the uh, uh, from the Not arts approval, honor. <laughs> of honor. Let's hear some of yours. Oh, I don't know. Vietnam Vets have certainly was one of those ones. Um, more recently, or uh, less uh, in the past, uh, uh, was a uh, uh, design competition using um, uh, environmental artists and landscape architects uh, in New Orleans uh, in one of the more significant yet unknown squares there. And uh, it was beautifully done. Bob Irwin and a local landscape architect won the competition. Uh, and the mayor refused to uh, build the result, uh, interjecting his aesthetic on the aesthetic of, uh, of um, groups of experts and community people who have been involved. Does that uh, happen out. often? Unfortunately, yes, and the reason for it is very simple. There are no rules of the game. You know, it wouldn't happen in law or medicine or any of the other professions where there are rules of the game, nor would it happen in football, in which uh, the, the, the t teams owner steps in and overrules the manager or... or, or, uh, or uh, so the how do architects defend themselves from <coughs> we the public? I suppose in forums like this. Uh, this kind of thing, exhibitions, um, popular press to a certain extent, yes, and by good behavior. And Does that, is that often the case? Well, I, th I think that architects have their own problems with uh, um, managing their own ethics over time. Let's talk, in fact, about the behavior of architects for a moment. While I don't think it has to be said that either you or I are very interested and committed to architecture in general and individual architects specifically, but it has often been said that architects compound the difficulties of their life. They do not make their work accessible to wider numbers of people. Do you think that's a fair accusation? Oh, well, yes, I think it's fair. But it's also fair to say that that's, that's the nature of any professionalized group in this country. Uh, obfuscation, uh, the creation of jargon, uh, is an inevitable consequence of specialization. Um, and it's a natural protective device out there. I happen to believe that fundamentally that you can demystify architecture and still maintain and retain its magic. And Actually, uh, that's what some people say you have been doing for these last five years. In fact, they say if Michael Pitas did not exist, they would have to invent him. I wonder if you would tell us in your travels throughout our 50 states what you see as the state of American architecture now. Oh, why? <laughs> Actually, the state of American architecture is quite good. It's very vital, it's exuberant, uh, but you're, it's not necessarily all in New York City, nor is it in Los Angeles or in San Where Francisco. Is it? It's in small towns, it's in Phoenix, it's in Tucson, uh, it's in... Uh, um, Are you being political or accurate now? No, is it I all am. over the country? Yes, I think so. I think that uh, what, what we are... What we haven't seen is, uh, all we see is what the popular press or the professional journals publish. And what we don't see is that vitality that exists out there and uh, literally thousands of, of practitioners uh, who are working with contextual, local problems which give forth all sorts of different kinds of formal manifestations. Well, if there are any recurring themes throughout our country these days in architecture, what are they? Well, certainly. Um, the restoration of historically and architecturally significant buildings and their reanimation, reuse for purposes. Uh, the other thing is a sense of humor. There's little doubt that uh, people like Stanley Tigerman, who produces uh, wonderful things in Chicago, uh, has a sense of humor that has been singularly lacking in the design professions. Do you see architecture as a sight gag? To a certain extent, it can be, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be. For these enduring buildings that you talked about earlier? Uh, that's, that's another issue, whether or not they endure. Uh, certainly the economic life of buildings, e.g. the Lever House, 
uh, is much shorter than its actual life. Uh, and that's particularly true of the private commercial ventures, which uh, are those which often have the humor in it. Um, so that uh, we're often talking about buildings with 10, 20 year lifetimes, depending on the depreciation tables of the tax laws. You've said that most architects today build for yesterday's problems. And what is still missing from the ideas of the best architects is an underlying vision. Yes. There's no question that, that architecture has narrowed its vision to, uh, well, let's call it the, the morphology of the artifact living, uh, and be damned the social consequences. Uh, and that's for good reason. We haven't been able to be very, we haven't been able to predict very well what those consequences are. Uh, certainly the social sciences have not been able to inform what we do very well, and uh, it's natural to say, well, if you can't give us answers, we'll go off and do our own thing. On the other hand, um, um, what we've become very good at doing is these incremental pieces. We have lost sight of the total totality. And not, I'm not talking about utopias or dystopias uh, in that sense, although those models have some influence and should be thought of. Uh, if Via Redius is, is one model of the future, so was Broadacre City, and both of them are here now in 1983. Uh, uh, and they may be the, the 1984 manifestation. Uh, but because those models were not successes does not mean that one should not extend oneself, that the field should not try to uh, uh, envision beyond what they've done. They're the only group that can give formal uh, vision or manifestation to, to uh, the new demographics of the country, lifestyles, household formations, etc. Those are critically important kinds of issues which are not being discussed in the vocabulary of architecture at all. I mean, what does it mean when, when mom, dad, or Ozzie Harriet, the two kids and the dog and cat, are not the predominant household in this country? What does it mean when there are so many single-family exactly, households? Exactly. The elderly, uh, single-person households, single person. extended family households are well, what unrelated. What does that mean extended? in terms of the way designs are evolving now? Well, it certainly means that the functional relationships between things probably oughtn't to be the way that they are or ought to be adjusted in some way or another. And what does it mean that we, for architecture, that we have a population that is living to an increasing age? Mm. How have we adapted our shelter toward that end? Exactly. Well, uh, certainly uh, the issue of open space, recreation, um, and all those kinds of, of characteristics of the landscape have not uh, been intended to, to any great extent uh, over the last few years. Uh, they've been considered a luxury, when in fact they should be considered a necessity. Uh, not that we have to uh, attend only to those issues alone, but uh, we do have a problem. And then, in terms of practical facts of life, given the state of urban economics, what can we hope for in terms of urban design and urban policy in the future? Well, I hope more patience, more vision, um, a sense of the relativity of things, one of the great problems in architecture and design and planning is a problem of training. You're trained to believe that every problem has a solution. You know, obviously, if you're going to design something, it's got to have a brick and mortar result at the end of it. Uh, but in order to have a sense of the future of this society, one has to take a more relativistic point of view. There are contingent futures. You've called yourself differences. a relativist. What do you mean when you say that? I mean basically that I'm, if, if, if I am to do good works, that I cannot believe that there is a singular solution. I have to be more ecumenical about my approach. I have to say that the postmodernists have something to give, as well as the contextualists and regional people, as well as the behaviorists and the social scientists who are involved, as well as the political scientists and econo uh, economists who are involved with the field. But that, that is you and your official role. Mm -mm. Privately. Privately, I believe that. Uh, it's the distinction, well, I like to characterize myself as an enabler rather than an author. I am less concerned that there be a building named after me when I'm long gone and dead, but I am concerned that uh, I shall have had some minor influence, some modest influence on the institutions and processes of society. Well, you're being too modest. How has your own training as an architect how has your own training as an architect been useful for the role that you now fill with the design arts program of the NEA? For the very reason that, that I was trained to believe that there was a solution to things, then I am not, 
I have not been hampered by um, uh, the need to find solutions. Um, in other words, city planners or social scientists or, or lawyers for that matter very seldom will take other than a one, an, an equivocal position on, on, a, on a thing. So I, I believe that there are some solutions and I'm willing to put them forward, at least well, to test them. What major changes have you made in the years since you have been director of the program? <laughs> Survival has always been a, a, a priority, priority issue, <laughs> issue. Uh, despite the fact that uh, architecture is sometimes called the mother of the arts, arts and sometimes the second oldest profession. Uh, it uh, doesn't gain that acknowledgement from its uh, progeny uh, that um, it might ought to get. So we're a very tiny program in a vast array of much more powerful artistic influences at the endowment. Uh, thus, it's very important for us to um, uh, maintain a position. So defending one's position is often uh, uh, the major uh, activity that I, I'm engrossed in. Well, there are all sorts of innovative ideas that you have established there. One of your ideas is the development of a presidential design arts program that you're planning for 1985. What do you have in mind? What's your goal there? Nothing more than, I think, um, raising the awareness of the effect of public design on the citizenry of this country uh, by, by raising it to uh, the presidential level. Design awards program, are, are, there's nothing new in design awards programs, uh, but there is a way of uh, bringing more public attention to them. Uh, and this is certainly nothing that has been invented in this country. Many countries uh, uh, use design awards programs uh, from their prime ministers and premiers uh, as a mechanism for, for uh, uh, raising public awareness in this area. So it's, it's an important endeavor, but it has its limitations in that sense. You've mentioned that time can make beautiful buildings or spaces even richer, which leads me to a subject that is obviously close to my heart, and that is your view of the role of historic preservation today? Hmm. Well, we certainly have gone a long way from the original period of seeing um, uh, architecturally and historically significant buildings as needing fossilization. Uh, There's no one else tied to a wreckers of all these days? Oh, I, you know, doubtless, uh, you know, there's case after case. You just open your newspapers of, of what out there, but the heightened awareness has made has made a significant difference. Uh, it is not simply uh, a, a well, an enlightened, well-educated uh, group out there standing before the city councils or board of estimates in this city um, um, and fighting the good fight. Uh, it's uh, people who you'd least expect to be out there uh, who, are, who, are, who are doing it. And for some why least pandemic. expect, and who are they? Well, I, I know of several instances in which, well, for example. Um, in Florida, uh, in southern Miami Beach, has probably got one of the most rich resources of Art Deco buildings anywhere in the country. And, and one it, of the most galvanized movements exactly, any place in the but country. That did not come from people who were uh, well educated in the history of architecture. They came from people who were retailers and landowners in the area who were longtime residents in, in that area. And what you got out of it was the first 20th century uh, historic district designation in this country. By the way, one of which uh, the Design Arts Program gave the early money for to try to support that kind of effort. Uh, How many historic preservation programs are there in the country? How many landmarks commissions are there in the United well, States now? I would have no way of estimating on, you'd have to ask the National Trust on that, but I suspect that there isn't a community in this country that doesn't have either a private group or a uh, publicly enfranchised group uh, to do it. Well, what's the most important function of the preservation movement today? Mm. Uh, it is the retention of cultural heritage without the, without fossilizing it. Then what do you see as its future? There are a finite number of buildings that are architecturally meritorious by the standards that Ten most Ten years ago, we would not have considered the Lever House architecturally or worthy of historic designation, and yet it's a, it's a raging debate at this particular point in time. There is nothing in... Ten years ago, it wasn't eligible for designation. Oh, yes, the building it, has to be 30 years old no. in order to be considered 
by the New York City Landmarks uh, Commission as contrasted to the National Register. Yeah, the National Register was particularly cleverly worded in that uh, it, it, it only made a suggestion of time. It did not, in fact, uh, mandate that a building or an object had to be that much older. So the, the New York law is more uh, constraining. Do you see preservation ultimately as a tool for city planning? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, from the uh, clear it all out and start all over attitude of the 1950s to the much more fine-grained, incremental, gradualist points of view today, uh, uh, you know, you've seen quite a significant turnaround in, in the use, even to the sense of reestablishing or trying to recreate what was there before. Certainly, uh, the success of, of Harbor Place, for example, in, in Baltimore has as much to do uh, with its uh, retailing and marketing as it does with the sense of nostalgia that the, uh, that the new construction creates. There is no restoration there. That's all brand new. Thing. But it gives you the impression of being... Another uh, Fanel Hall or exactly, another South Street exactly, Seaport, exactly. which every community seems to want these well, days. The, unfortunately, we have that problem with atrium hotels. and uh, We tend to, again, replicate the form without understanding the process by which it came about. So yes, we're going to have exactly that happening all over the country. How much of the field and how successfully has the field of architecture and design changed in the years that you've been involved with it? Hmm. Well, one thing that has uh, been significant has been the view of the architectural drawing as an art form in its own right. Uh, that did not exist to any large extent uh, except for collectors of particular architects uh, in the past. Uh, and that has had a major influence in my mind about uh, what architects do. So that they are as concerned now about how they communicate in, on paper as they are about how they communicate in reality. That has some liabilities associated with it as well because what looks what good on well what looks good on paper doesn't always look good when it comes out as a building and i guess in the end the only way to see a building is to see the building that's right and you can't uh, in one day proclaim it the greatest building of the century just on by virtue of its drawings as some of our critics are fond of doing why don't we talk not only about what some architects do but what some architects did and now i'm thinking of you in the early days of your career you took a job as chief designer for a firm in New Jersey hmm. that was known more for the quantity than quality of its work. From what I understand it, I have a lot of regrettable buildings out there as, uh, uh, on the New Jersey landscape, uh, um, which um, I'd rather not remember. <laughs> <laughs> what did that experience teach you about the workings and possibilities of both public housing and about architecture? Well, it certainly taught me uh, a great deal about the degree to which the public sector influenced design. Uh, first experience in that area was in developing an eight-story public housing uh, super block uh, and finding that uh, I was constrained in any number of ways from square footages of rooms to limited to minimum dimensions to how big a window could be to how big a door could be to how much distance to a fire escape. In fact, to such a point where uh, I became very much like a, a plumber uh, just arranging plumbing. Uh, and then I said, well, this is the way it is. Uh, now, the next thing to do is to play with the facade. Maybe we can get some something into that. And I managed to work out a system where I mirrored uh, the plans and created some diversity on the facade and then was promptly told by the public house Housing board that it looked too good, and in the middle class neighborhood, it was not nice to make uh, uh, public housing look good for uh, the reasons that were obvious at that time. Um, it was through that experience that it, I came to the conclusion that, uh, that uh, if you really wanted to make a difference, you had to change some of the rules of the game. And if you had to change the rules of the game, I thought at that time that the public sector was the major arena in which that could happen. That was, those were heady days. John Lindsay had come to New York and uh, the whole urban design team had started up at that point and uh, I joined them shortly thereafter and uh, uh, became intrigued by the whole process. Have you changed your mind about the influence of the public sector? No, not in the least. I've only changed my mind about our naivete in some of the things we did. 
Uh, for example, the enfranchisement of the, or the legalization of the Soho district was probably a very bad mistake. You Why? Know, oh, well, very simply this. I mean, you mean the Soho district in New York City? That's right. Why was that a mistake? I thought it was one of the most cherished and sought after models of bringing the artists to the center of town and integrating them into the society. In point of fact, the artist was there already and was living Quickly there. Quickly driven out by the dentist. Yes, exactly. The alternate Upper East Side lifestylers were uh, allowed then to come in because you created the legal, the value, by legalizing it, what you did was create the real estate value in the area. But by uh, illegalizing it, you couldn't even permit the archi you there was by illegalizing a, it, at that time there was a de facto hands-off policy by both the fire department, um, HDA at that time. After and, many years of eviction and yes, living at the yes. edge of the but ledge. There was an accommodation at that point in time. Um, and the mistake was to uh, legalize it because uh, it could have gone on for many years providing um, a place for artists without that happening. So you're saying that that ambiguity in certain sectors Is of useful. the city and desirable yes, as well. Exactly. Are we about to make any other similar mistakes that we shouldn't be considering? Well, we do it all the time. What was the latest one? Uh, I've forgotten what it was called. Rule 10 or uh, which... Uh, local Law 10. Local Law 10. Removing... That's right. Removing... Uh, not removing. What it said is you had to fix up uh, exactly. all the cornices and, and wonderful details. Or any on ornamental buildings. details that may be loose on a building exactly. as a result of a indeed and tragic... what's the result? Building stripped bare. Exactly. Okay. So that maybe part of the difficulty is communication. Mm -hmm. And predicting the consequences. For example, when the theater district idea was put forward, that is that Again, we, we're talking about the theater district in New York. In New York, yes. Uh, when basically what was, and this is the crude, crudest and most rudimentary forms of incentive zoning. The idea was simply that you would trade off um, uh, excess air rights or, or, or more space to commercial developers in exchange for that diseconomic use called a legitimate theater. Unfortunately, what we were looking at at that time was a period of time in, on Broadway in which not very much theater product was coming out and naturally everybody was going broke. Uh, so uh, all the theaters were going under at that point in time. Uh, but not two to three years later uh, do we have our magic seasons in which there was enormous successes this on Broadway. This isn't one of them. But so it may No, it isn't. isn't. It's a cyclical business. It goes up and down all the time. You but we didn't acknowledge that in, in the fact that we gave away 20% uh, uh, additional floor space, uh, which will be there in perpetuity or as long as those buildings exist and as long as there's a theater in the bottom on the fallacious notion that, uh, that, the, that the, the theaters um, needed a continuous subsidy in order to s be supported. It's true at certain points in time. It's not true at other points in time. How would you deal with the whole and very complicated circumstance of a theater district that is not only a collection of real estate, but also a specific industry? Well, the first thing I do with respect to the, the Broadway theater district uh, is to assert the public's right to downzone this nonsense of, of seeing and uh, saying that an individual landowner has an inalienable right to some fictitious airspace above him and that that has economic value, which it does, the thing, but that it's Im immutable, untouchable by virtue of the fact that it exists in some body of law does not mean that you can't change the law. And one of the things that this country, that this city has not done, which it should have done a long time ago, is assert that right to down zone. Now that that means basically relieving uh, those property owners of that speculative real estate uh, value up there. Now, that's, that's, that may sound fantastic in a city like this, but it was done, has been done continuously in many other cities. The reason why the north end of Boston exists, the old Italian community exists at all today, is because of three successive down zonings, so that the, the envelope available for building is exactly the envelope that is there right now. You made reference to excess air rights. Are there ever excess air rights in the center of a densely populated urban environment? Only to the extent that the public uh, allows that there shall be. And I'm saying this as, as, as a matter of law and right. One of the things that we haven't addressed today is the role of the citizen or the community activist uh, in the whole question of shaping and altering the design of the places that people work and shop and live and play. Mm. How important has that become? Oh, 
uh, this city is probably the object lesson in, in that respect. Um, there's no, no question that from the late 60s onwards, um, we were into participatory democracy, somewhere representative democracy had gotten lost in the process, um, uh, to the extent where uh, the courts were, were, were beginning to act like legislators, and, and, um, and uh, it was considered uh, uh, a necessity to involve as many people as possible. In fact, it became part of new legislation all over the country, federal and public legislation of all sorts. Uh, but essentially, in that period of time, uh, and to date, in many places in the country, the degree to which communities and, and lay citizens involve themselves and participate in that process is basically reactive. That is, um, we have discovered that we can stop things. We haven't quite discovered how to begin things or to make things happen. Uh, and probably New York has achieved that point or gotten to uh, that point to a certain extent with the uh, legalization or, or the creation of uh, uh, the community boards, uh, which have some ability to move affirmatively rather than in, only in a reactive posture. Um, I'm not sure whether it leads to better things. Uh, it leads to one generation certainly making decisions for other generations in a more uh, widespread area. But uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't point to anything that was better designed because of that, the existence of that out there. When I think of all the years of training you've had and all the years of experience you've had as an architect, I wonder if there is a corner view that isn't eager to start designing again. No, I'm not going to make that mistake. <laughs> not at all. Uh, I've carved out my territory and uh, uh, I think that despite the fact that the kind of work I do does not receive the kind of rewards or professional acknowledgement uh, that, that um, some people might think ought to be there. I think it's wonderful work to do, and I wouldn't give it up for anything. It's kind of like uh, uh, the same kind of feeling I have about teaching. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think it's thoroughly consistent with the way I want to be. I'm not going to make the mistake of, of going back to going back to design as m many of my colleagues who've been in the public sector have done. Well, what sacrifices have you made in your career while you have been in the nation's service? Well, certainly uncertainty and unpredictability um, uh, uh, are part and parcel of what I do. Uh, uh, there is no institutional home for people like myself, so we have to uh, pretty much uh, go with the flow and find opportunities, make opportunities for ourselves uh, out there. Uh, we can't uh, simply set ourselves up in an office and be. Uh, one of the things that uh, characterizes people like myself is that we believe in institutions. Uh, or we believe in the power of institutions, uh, and we don't ignore them as, as, as means of achieving ends. Uh, you have to clarify that a bit, Michael. Listening to you and mm -hmm. knowing you a bit, you're obviously a, I don't want to say maverick, that's not the right word, but you certainly, and I don't want to say iconoclast, but you certainly are a, an open and innovative thinker, and it seems to me that is directly in contrast with what most of us think of as traditional establishment institutions, particularly the ones that you've been associated with. So it is always astonishing to me that not only do you manage to survive, but flourish. Uh, How do you explain <laughs> it? I guess I'm a good bureaucrat at the same time. Uh, no, uh, I, I, I'd say this, that uh, despite um, the characterization of institutions as, as being these stuffy places in which um, creativity is stifled, uh, in fact, what happens over time is institutions go through cycles, like all other kinds of, of, of human organizations. And they very often call on people like myself to do things. What I meant by the unpredict imp uh, unpredictability and uncertainty of it is that it lasts for very short periods of time. Then you have to go off and do something else. Really. Well, what um, would you like to do if you could, if you had the opportunity to invent your next career? What would it be? Lord, I am. I haven't had a chance to think about that at all. Uh, I'm sure it'll come upon me without my having well, anything any to do with it. Is there any secret dream or desire that you have that you haven't had a chance to act out yet? Yes, I'd like to write. Um, certainly the, uh, the kinds of things I'm interested in I'd like to put down on paper. And uh, uh, that hasn't uh, presented itself as an opportunity. 
Is writing among your own goals? Yes, I'd say so. Did you ever imagine that your life would unfold the way it has? No, no. I what feel did that, you have in mind? Oh, I, I'm afraid I had very limited goals or not, not very much in the way of goals at all. Uh, so I feel extraordinarily privileged that I've been managed to do what I've been able to do. Uh, um, there are very few people in society that are given the privilege of having some discretion about where their lives can go and what they, how they can function and the degree to which they can or cannot contribute. I think. So, um, no, my goals were, were much more constrained in the beginning. I'm always surprised um, that I've achieved anything. We're fortunate that you have. But not only have you had an opportunity to achieve your own goals, you've also altered the way so many of us lead our lives. Does that awesome responsibility ever strike you? Well, to the extent that that stewardship exists, um, yes, it, it strikes me as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a responsibility and obligation, uh, as well as, as, as something that I, sh I should be proud of, to, to the extent that it exists. I, I, you know, you'll, you'll, you do have to go a long way, Barbara Lee, to convince me that, that any particular act or anything I've been involved with has directly influenced large numbers of lives. I'm counting on history. All right. <laughs> we have talked today about, largely about architecture, mm -hmm. but here you are, the steward of the design arts. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned eight disciplines, and we focused largely on one of them. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us briefly, as you see it, the state of some of the other of the design arts? Certainly, um, landscape architecture, for example, uh, has taken a tact uh, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, landscape architects have become the city planners. Uh, they've become the conservers of, of natural environment. They've become f far more scientific and sy systematic about their approach to things than anybody could have ever imagined. Uh, uh, future, I mean, in, in the past. And, uh, for example, in California now, um, landscape architects are often the prime contractors and, it, and architects are the subcontractors on major uh, development projects, which has uh, surprised a lot of people. But it isn't surprising in terms of the knowledge base there. Um, urban design uh, has gone through a peak period and now seems to be leveling off. Uh, and uh, has lost a lot of its public place. For example, the urban design group uh, and the urban design functions in, in city government here in New York, which was used as the national model, uh, have uh, slowly dissolved. Uh, more completely recently, dissolved completely at dissolved at this juncture. Uh, what has replaced them? If, if in the cyclical nature of things, urban design is not the vogue of the moment, What's the new hot topic? Well, I'm not, I'm not particularly concerned because if you look back in the period of uh, the early 60s, what you'll find is the most, uh, that that organization which was producing urban design and the visions of the city happened to be the private sector. The Re Regional Plan Association, R RPA, at that time produced most of the things uh, that we call urban design today. So what I see happening is that, the, is that we'll see a transference to some other aspect. Now, maybe it'll be the nonprofit sector or the private sector. Again, maybe RPA will pick it up. Maybe it'll be regional, et cetera. But certainly the imperative will come from the need to remake the infrastructure uh, of the city. I mean, the third water tunnel isn't the only need here, but it will it will compel planning. And if the sewer lines and water lines compel planning, that's terrific because eventually it'll reach the surface of the ground and eventually it'll change mm -hmm. the form of the cities. Uh, and this is a very deadly serious issue in this country. You know, we need to do something very rapidly about the disintegration of those systems before we have major catastrophe on our hands. Are we bordering on that? Certainly. And uh, what are we doing about it? Well, very little planning, per se, at this particular point in time. Uh, uh, it's going to take a national, may take a national catastrophe in order to do that. A city's water supply being totally cut off and not returnable within, within um, a very short period of time. And this do you could foresee happen. that as a possibility? Certainly, yes. Are any cities more in danger than others? Uh, Phoenix is as much as New York City is. Uh, in, in that sense. Well, what's uh, anybody doing about this? I mean, we're sitting here and talking about, you know, catastrophe on an enormous scale. Mm -hmm. uh, not very much, as far as I know. Right. 
and what do you do in your role to engender some activity toward changing those situations? Speak up on public forums like this <laughs> on that kind of issue. What about the other design arts? Industrial and product design. Um, that area has uh, gone through a certain kind of change, a trauma in this country, mainly because uh, it's become clear that industrial designers and product designers have uh, been uh, more of a decorative art than they've been a, uh, a substantial uh, design uh, uh, profession in this country. And that's not because they wanted to be so, but because they were asked to put fins on Cadillacs rather than to redesign the form of cars. Uh, and for a long time now, most of the major schools of industrial design in this country have uh, been producing students who are not being hired by Detroit or the main, major consumer products manufacturers in this country, but being hired by uh, the Germans and the Japanese and the Swedes and, and the British, etc. In fact, we've exported a great deal of talent over the last uh, decade. Uh, we such. have our own brain drain in the exactly, design Exactly, exactly. Where so did everybody go? Oh, they all went over there to, to BMW and Honda and Nissan, etc. Um, I'm not suggesting to you that the sole source of uh, design inspiration uh, for uh, those products which compete so dearly in the market against American products are Americans, but they certainly are a major con contributor to it. Uh, that's simply a matter, uh, well, simply a matter, it's a, it, it's a very complex matter of the structure of American industry. Uh, we talk about American industry as having a number of uh, faults and flaws, uh, the need to retool, uh, the short-sightedness of profits, etc. Um, um, uh, but part of the problem is the degree to which design is a component of the management process and the degree to which it's part of the research and development process. And the state, the, and the current state and future possibilities of fashion as a design art? There you always have a problem <laughs> um, because most of the work we've done in the fashion fields have, have dealt principally with those who are not dealt with by the commercial sector. That is the handicapped uh, or, uh, or looking at issues of energy conscious design. For example, when Bonnie Cashin invented the layered look in fashion, she did so in, in a, with a very thorough knowledge of the, uh, the energy conserving nature of, of fabric. Um, and the idea of the layered look was you went in and out of cold and hot spaces all the time and you were able to take off and she, her analysis uh, dealt with that issue. Well, the layered look then was picked up again uh, as form rather than function and, um, uh, and, and replicated fa faddishly as fashion in that sense. I think. Uh, so uh, if you're asking me about the future of the fashion industry, it's always got a vital future. There's no question about that. I think. But what, what technical areas or what design areas, research areas are going on are kind of interesting. What about the future of the government funding industry? Government funding industry. <laughs> all depends on what you want to talk about in that area. Um, for example, I could make a very strong case that we ought to be spending a great deal more on buildings and the design of buildings uh, today than we ever had um, because we need to make those buildings and those spaces sustain populations much in much for much longer periods of time. Uh, and I would submit evidence called life cycle costing, which would show that uh, you know the productivity of workers, white collar workers, in in office space is greatly enhanced by the environments in there. And you can put an actual dollar figure of of loss of productivity per worker uh, for not having those kinds of environmental amenities. Uh, so if we're talking about a society which needs to become more productive. Uh, part of the way it becomes more productive is by more conscious attention paid to the physical environment in which things happen. I think that the evidence for it is all there. It's been there for years, basically. Um, but um, you know, as the body politic uh, necessarily has to has to uh, think or just thinks in shorter term. I mean, I've never met a mayor who will uh, allow me to go ahead with a building uh, when I worked for local government unless he could uh, cut the ribbon on that building by the end of his term, predictably. I mean, uh, if the thing took longer than that, then it wasn't worth doing, uh, you see. Who decides on who gets grants? You have a, a system of panel review. How does that work? Can you tell us briefly how the panel review system works and who decides who is a member of the panel? Well, I've, 
you know, the endowments chairman basically decides who are members of, 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 of panels that review various kinds of artistic endeavors. Uh, but he doesn't decide on all of them by any means. Uh, what happens is a list uh, is, is brought to him uh, uh, of recommended people. Uh, now, uh, if it was the dance program or the theater program at the endowment, uh, it is likely that you would have uh, a list of people who would tend to be the same people from year to year over time. In some respects, that's because the fields are limited. Um, there are only something like a, an order of, of 600 museums in this country that uh, qualify for endowment funding. Uh, and, they're only and in your program? Well, there's the, there's the distinction. Uh, what I do is constantly rotate panels, with the exception of the policy panel, that is my policy board. Um, I, I, I bring forward lists of roughly about 100 names each year, which are suggestions from the fields, basically, uh, and change th and rotate people off so that only, people only serve once on a panel for the most part uh, in deciding about grants. And that's because there's a quarter million designers out there and maybe another mil million allied professionals and people like yourself who have something to contribute. And it squares with my, at least my ecumenical view of what, what should be um, uh, done in the decision making process there. I would, I would How much of the endowment's budget is allotted to design arts? Oh, very little. Uh, anywhere between four and a half and six and a half million dollars a year. And in terms of percent? Uh, that couldn't be more than about uh, four percent of the budget. With an activist, persuasive fellow like yourself, is that good or bad news? Uh, I guess I shouldn't say it publicly, but in, in fact, uh, I don't think it matters that very much. There is a, a level of funding which is necessary in order to sustain uh, previous efforts and, and, and what you want to do. But um, we're not talking about the need for subsidy that exists in dance or theater or in the visual arts. We're talking about um, the need to get out the word and to sustain uh, nascent ideas where there is no other public support for those, for those ideas. Uh, you know, it's a quite a different kind of uh, animal, and uh, um, you know, I, I would not make any any uh, uh, argument that you have to subsidize the architectural muse uh, in, to any great extent. Right? Not by any means. Is there anything that you, we haven't talked about that you'd care to? No, nothing I can think of. We talked a lot of subjects. We sure did, <laughs> mm -hmm. Michael. If you had it to do all over again. What would you do otherwise? Oh, I've sometimes said to myself, gee, if I only had a law degree or a B-school degree, or uh, gosh, if I only take philosophy or theology, et cetera. Well, I, 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 suspo I suspect if I did it all over again, I would try to get a, a much more firmer grounding in the humanities and history. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, education was singularly lacking in that area, and, and, and most of what I've picked up has been indiscriminate uh, and picked up in, in non-formal settings. What about that budding Picasso? <laughs> Does he ever have an opportunity I to I think explain? he had his time. Yes. yes. Well, this is surely your time, and I'm so glad that you've spent some of it with us. Thank you, Michael Pitas, for being with us today. Thank you. Just bravo. It's just wonderful. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it was wonderful to listen to. You. No, it was terrific. It was terrific. After your first five minutes when you were talking into your necktie, which I forgot about, because I knew we'd get over that. I, well,